Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Views, episode 203. And this time I'm talking about Lonnie Liston Smith's debut as a leader with his group, The Cosmic Echoes. It's called Astral Traveling. It comes from 1973. This record is not from 1973. It's from, I don't know, 2014 or something. It's a re release on Real Gone Records with uh, fancy uh, blue vinyl and so on. And I'm not normally a fan of colored vinyl, but this one actually sounds terrific. So you'd have no regrets if you pick this up. When it comes to Lonnie Liston Smith, and again, not to confuse him with Dr. Lonnie Smith, who also was a keyboard whiz, also was a jazz funk exponent, also had a penchant for hats, most of the discussion that you'll find or you'll read really has to do with when he ceases to be jazz and becomes something else, an R&B guy or a smooth jazz guy or something like that. This, however, is a record which, while part of that transition, is pretty much loved by everybody across the spectrum. It's one of his greatest astral jazz records, in fact, probably one of the greatest astral jazz records of all time. And if you're into accessibility as well as astral jazz, this may be the greatest astral jazz record of all time. Lonnie Liston Smith was born in Richmond, Virginia in 1940. He moved to Baltimore as a teen and he begins to become known in the local music scene, both as a backing vocalist and also as a piano player. After high school, he goes to Morgan State University in Baltimore and he gets a bachelor's in music in 1961. Then in 1963, after playing the local circuit for a while, he moves to New York City. His talent becomes pretty obvious to those in the jazz scene and his first significant lasting gig was as a sideman for the vocalist Betty Carter. He then moves over to play with Roland Kirk and in 1965, he makes his debut as a sideman on Kirk's album, Here Comes the Whistle Man. In the winter of 65-66, he spends some time with Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers. He then goes back with Roland Kirk to make some more records and then spends a bit of time in 1967 touring with Max Roach. His trajectory at this point is leading him closer and closer to Pharaoh Sanders, but at this point I'd like to take a little deviation and talk about the origins of astral jazz. In the summer of 1967, John Coltrane dies. In the latter years of his career, he'd spent a lot of time with both his wife, Alice Coltrane, and also a young saxophonist, Pharaoh Sanders, exploring the boundaries of jazz, exploring the spiritual potential of jazz. And the first album that Sanders makes after Coltrane's death is an album called Tauhid, which is widely considered to be the first astral jazz album and is a masterpiece, it's sublime. So what is astral jazz? Pretty much everybody who played it had been schooled either in hard bop or at least some of them in free jazz, but it's nothing like hard bop and it's nothing like free jazz. So, if you look at the evolution of jazz in the post-war period as a series of reactions, I guess you can say there is a pretty clear linkage. From the 1930s to the end of the Second World War, swing pretty much dominates the jazz world. Pretty heavily regimented and obviously heavily orchestrated music, and the improviser, although there is improvisation in swing, is largely subordinated to the orchestral whole, largely subordinated to the tune. By the 1940s, for a lot of players, this is getting kind of stale, and bebop, led by people like Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Thelonious Monk, and others, emerges first as an after hours, after the club is shut, when the musicians are still there, a series of improvisations and experimentations and just general hanging out amongst musicians. There's wild improvisation, it's almost manic at times, and over time, there's another movement which kind of emerges as a reaction, which is basically hard bop, which slows the music down, makes it more melodic, it also brings the blues into the music a lot more. And this music, hard bop, dominates the 1950s. However, by 1958-59, once again, people are starting to get itchy feet. Hard bop's getting a bit stale, it's very formulaic. You've got the head arrangement where you state the melody, there's two or three or four solos, you state the head arrangement again, and there you go, and you work through a whole bunch of standards that way, six or seven tracks an album. And in this time, people start to break out of various musical jails, breaking out of the expectations around chord progressions, which is what Davis does in Kind of Blue, breaking out of expectations around melody and form and tonality. This is Coleman, this is Coltrane, Don Sherry, Cecil Taylor, and so on. Other influences are coming into the mix too at various points around here, including from Cuba and Africa via Dizzy Gillespie, from Brazil via Stan Getz and Charlie Bird, from Religion led by John Coltrane. So by the middle 1960s, cutting edge jazz is all about breaking a whole bunch of different bonds, form, chords, melody, harmony, tonality, Western musical conventions. At the time, it feels like the whole world is burning with the reaction against the civil rights movement, assassinations, the growing fact of the Vietnam War. A lot of people are channeling their rage at this into their music, and that's very much what we hear, for instance, from Archie Shep. But others start to try and find a place, and if they have to, create a place which is a bit of an oasis. And this is very much the story of astral jazz. And what you get from a lot of players is an increased focus on spirituality and tranquility, often in a highly rhythmic manner. So you get a lot of use of ostinatos or vamps, 
for the jazz terms, and rock you'd call those riffs. Repetitive forms, re-rhythmic forms, really get you into a groove. So now back to Lonnie Liston Smith. Sanders, as I mentioned, had made this great album, a great Astro Jazz album, called Tauhid in 67. He'd also heard the work that Smith had done on record with Hassan Roland Kirk, and so in 68 he reaches out to him and says, do you want to be part of my ensemble? Smith says yes. What follows is a two or three year collaboration between four extraordinary talents, Sanders, Smith, the vocalist Leon Thomas, and the great bassist Cecil McBee. Their work is best found on four records put out under Sanders' name, Karma, Jewels of Thought, Thembi and Azifo Zam, which doesn't come out until a little bit later, though it was recorded around this time, and also on Leon Thomas's debut album, Spirits Known and Unknown. In this time, and specifically while recording the album Thembi, Smith discovers the Fender Rhodes electric piano, which of course is such a signature instrument for jazz funk all the way through the 70s, and quickly becomes one of its leading exponents, and frankly, one of its real wizards. He then goes on to play in the early 1970s with Gatto Barbieri, and crucially, he also spends a brief but important apprenticeship with Miles Davis in 1972-73. A lot of that work ends up on On the Corner. In 1973, after the better part of a decade as a well-regarded sideman in New York, Smith decides finally to go out on his own. He forms a group called the Cosmic Echoes, and Bob Thiel, who of course had been John Coltrane's producer during that wonderful stretch of records at Impulse in the 1960s, and now had his own label, Flying Dutchman, signs up Lonnie and the Cosmic Echoes, and they go into the studio to make this record. It's recorded in New York in 1973. It's not exactly clear when. It's also not exactly clear where, but it's pretty likely it was at RCA Studios, where Thiel did most of his recording for Flying Dutchman around this time. Smith, of course, is on acoustic piano and also Fender Rhodes. There's a guy called Joe Beck, who would go on to record for CTI and guitar, and another guy called George Barron, who plays soprano sax and tenor sax. This is one of his only recordings. And importantly for the feel of the record, the band has a five-person percussion session, led, of course, by the bassist McBee, with whom Smith had done so much work. James Ntume and Sonny Morgan are on percussion. Badal Roy, the tabla player, is on tabla. And Smith had also asked him to play the tambour, which is the signature instrument for all of astral jazz. He'd said, well, actually, women typically play the tambour, so I'm going to ask my wife, Gita Vashi, to come in, so she plays the tambour on this record. The record starts with Astral Traveling, which of course is this song's second appearance on a record. The main difference between this record and those classic Sanders records is obviously that Sanders is not playing sax. And the sax here is handled, as I mentioned, by George Barron, who is a good sax player. He's not really at Sanders' level. He doesn't try the kinds of things that Sanders does. That means in some respects this music can be a little bit less exciting, but it also means this music is much more accessible. This is a lovely, warm, immersive sound, and that immersive feeling extends all the way through both sides of this record. Let us go into the house of the Lord is next. This is another rerun from a Sanders record. This is epically spiritual. McBee's bass, for me, is what really stands out here. It's incredibly low at times. It seems almost subterranean. The side concludes with Rejuvenation, which is the jazziest of all the tracks here. Very much still the astral feel, although what you do also pick out is David Lee doing what appears to be his best Elvin Jones impression, albeit somewhat buried in the mix and soaked in reverb. Side 2 starts with I, Manny, or Faith, which begins with a super Pharaoh Sandersy kind of fanfare introduction, which is so typical of so many of his tracks. Barron starts to play this really scronking, heavily overblown, rather adventurous sax, and this is a total throwback to the Sanders stuff, to Archie Shep's work, those kinds of things. Eventually, that moment passes, and then we're back into that warm river drifting downstream again. This is probably the edgiest track on all of the records that Lonnie Liston Smith put out as a leader, and this is probably my favorite track in the record. In Search of Truth is next, and at this point, the record is really feeling like, for me, all of the sweetest parts of Pharaoh Sanders' records. It's super, super enjoyable. What we're lacking a little bit is Pharaoh's gift for a funky riff, because although McBee is doing his part in this, Baron isn't really up to that, and that shows a little bit. The record concludes with Aspirations, which is another incredible track, throbbing and tinkling, it's ecstatic music, and it's just a wonderful way to end this whole experience. The critic Robert Criscow says he loves this record, but he hankers a bit at times for the harshness which Pharaoh would bring, and I kind of get that, but at the same time, when Pharaoh is being harsh, I often am waiting for that warm immersion to return, and you get much more warm immersion on this particular record. It's a gorgeous, flowing, immersive experience for the soul. It's one of the great astral jazz records and one of the great records of the 1970s, and for me, it's five out of five.